Well, good morning. Welcome. You can start to make your way in. Let's come together as the redeemed people of God to give glory to his name, to acknowledge his goodness and his faithfulness towards us. As we come as the new people of God, redeemed, forgiven. Hear this from the word of the Lord, Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. Amen. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. This is a house of healing. Our hearts are full of faith. Your blood runs through 
Amen and amen. Thanks, worship team. Go ahead and take a seat. It is so good to see you all this morning. Uh, I just want to, it's just one of my highlights is being here on Sunday. Of course, uh, I'm Shelly. I'm the student ministry pastor. So Wednesday nights is another highlight of mine to be at this church with our students. But gosh, I'm just really excited because we're in this Easter Plus series where we are just experiencing and living out all the joy and generosity that Easter brings. Because Easter is not just something we celebrate once, but we are keeping the momentum going because we are living out the resurrection every day, new life. And it just brings us so much joy. And I thought this morning, um, because we had such an incredible time last week with one service, jumpies, food. It was incredible to be together as a community. And I just thought this morning, it's so easy for us to come in. We take our seat. Maybe you have the same seat every time. And we just look forward and we're like, I'm worshiping Jesus. And it's like, that's great, but we're here together. Can you believe that? So much fun, this whole community. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to take just about a minute and we're going to get up and we're going to meet a couple people. You're going to say hello, introduce yourself. If you're like, Shelly, I'm too awkward for that. I don't know what to say after I say my name. Here's a little prompt. What is something that's bringing you joy? And thinking, yes, Jesus brings us joy, but what are the good gifts that Jesus is bringing in your life right now that's bringing you joy right now in this season? So take one minute, stand up, meet a couple people, share your name, and share a little bit what's bringing you joy. Take 30 more seconds. and then come take a seat. Come take a seat. I know. Can I just say, this is what brings me joy. Seeing not us just looking forward and worshiping, but connecting with one another because we are just the body of Christ. We're a community together. And this, I mean, I'm up here like a giddy, so excited. This is awesome. I love seeing you connect with others. Well, something else that brings me joy is uh, an event that we have coming up. Uh, We have a women's ministry event, and I have these two ladies up here that are going to share a little bit about it. So, Joyce, will you take it away? Yes. Thank you, Shelly. Good morning. Yes, it's morning (laughs) time. Yes, it is. (laughs) Hi, everyone. So my name is Joyce, and um, I've been attending MCC for over two and a half years now, and it's been a joy to be a part of this community. One of the things that I thought about was just pure community has been such a blessing to me and my family's life. And since joining, there has been a lot of opportunities to get plugged in, and one of the few ways was through leading a monthly meetup group for women, as well as participating in helping out some of our ministry events. And so sometimes when you're new to this to the city or this area like me, it's hard to get plugged in and you'll find difficulty navigating, you know, how it goes with developing a new, um, you know, friendships or community, people that are like-minded as you want to, as we seek to learn more about God. And so I really, you know, 
look forward to every year to the annual Women's Spring Luncheon. And I'm so excited because we're going to have it this year again. So I will um, love to pass on the mic to Nancy for her to share more about the details of the luncheon. Um, hi, my name is Nancy Rakoff, and along with Joyce, I'm a member of the Women's Ministry event team, including Meg Keller and Kelly Dirks. So on behalf of all the, the women, I would like to invite you to our spring luncheon, which is occurring Saturday, May 4th at noon at the home of Jennifer Croner. Um, we will be outdoors enjoying hopefully beautiful spring weather. Um, and uh, the, the event is in San Rafael. There is no charge. And I just wanted to share a little bit about why I love women's ministry events. To me, participating in women's ministry is like having an instant sisterhood. It doesn't matter your age or stage. You are going to meet somebody who you can bless and who can bless you because you share the same joys, the same struggles, the same opportunities. Um, just to share a personal story, a year ago, we had our women's ministry luncheon at, at Meg Keller's house. And I sat next to a woman that I did not know and had never seen at church, I didn't think. And as we started sharing about our lives, by the end of lunch, I had met somebody. We had so much in common. I couldn't believe it. And I left with a prayer sister who is still praying for me today, and I for her. And so th this is part of our goal for women's ministry, is that every woman feel loved, every woman be seen, be ministered to, um, be met, have an have a opportunity to connect. Um, with a sister of um, like interests and like, like needs. And we want everybody to just be pampered for a couple of hours. And, you know, I think that's actually a spiritual discipline, being pampered. Yes, Sabbath. Uh, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> so true. So we want everybody to be there. Um, it's really our goal to share a blessing and to help you connect with others like yourselves. However, act today because we have nearly 60 women already registered. We've got space for 20 more. And by the end of the service, we'd like to see all those 20 um, spaces snatched up. So please, um, I, actually, I think Joyce is going to tell you how to do that. Yeah, and honestly, uh, I think you guys asked me to do like a prayer there, and I haven't signed up yet. So can you tell us how to sign up? That'd be great. All right. So the way to sign up for the event is through the Church Center app for our church, MCC. Once you enter the homepage, you will see five icons on the bottom. Click the fourth one titled Event, and it's a picture of a little square with a pencil in the middle, <clears throat> and it's on the... Okay, so yes, so through that, um, after you enter that uh, the option, you will see a list of our events, and you will see this picture that's pulled up on the slides here, and once you press that event, um, our event, you may register by filling in your, your information. There is a button underneath called regist uh, on the right, lower right-hand side, register. So fill in your information, submit, and we'll receive your registration on our end. And so, if, but if you need help today, you may find any one of us or the Start Here table after service, and we would love to help you navigate through the page. Yes. So now I would like to invite up Tinley to pray for us. Good morning, church. Will you pray with me? Father God, it is so good to be in your house together this morning this house of praise and of healing, where we feel you moving and working, drawing us back to you, Lord, and meeting us right here in our place. We thank you for your constant pursuit of us, for knowing the weakest spaces of our hearts, yet still choosing to love us. And we thank you for all the times in which you have met us with your grace and mercy through our days past and to come. This morning, Lord, we are celebrating still and with deep gratitude your victory and redemption for us. We are grateful that through your suffering and humility, we have a chance at a new life. And we proclaim that truth over and over, that we are yours, chosen and set apart. So we pray, Lord, that we would live into that truth, that we would live a life that is holy and pleasing to you 
that we would build deep relationships in our community, that we would be people of joy and fully filled with your presence, Lord. So Lord, help us live out what your kingdom looks like here and now. That is what we long for. So come, Lord Jesus, and do your work here today. We pray this in your name. Amen. We are going to continue our time of worship through our tithes and offerings. Um, There are baskets in the front as well as in the back for the offerings. And if you are an online giver, there is a laminated card in the seat pocket in front of you. Um, Also in the seat pockets are index cards that you can use to write a prayer request. And you can place that in the offering as well. We'll go ahead and dismiss our children to the children's ministry, um, birth through pre-K. Let's continue to worship. Please stand with us as we um, continue to worship um, through our tithes and offerings and lifting our voices up to him today.
Lord, hear the praises of your people today in this place. We welcome your presence. Be exalted now in the heavens. And as your glory fills this place, may you alone, you are the only one true God who deserves our praise. You are the name above all names. So Lord, just come fill this place with your presence, your gentle peace, your comfort, your unfailing love. There may be some among us today who are just came today to just see if you're real. Lord, we believe you are real. So if you are real, come and meet us here. Meet us here in this place in a way that only each one of our hearts can hear and feel and see and taste your goodness. Just pour out your love, Lord. Just pour it out. Because that's truly the deepest need in each one of our hearts. So may we encounter you today in this moment. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Control. 
you've heard our prayer as we worshiped you this morning. Will you meet us here again? We're asking for you to meet us here. We thank you in advance because you promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. So thank you, God, that although the world tells us that we're enough, we're all that we need, but you say, oh, I have so much more for you. Come, Holy Spirit. Dry bones awaken today as we hear your word. In your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Welcome, everyone. You may be seated. Welcome once again to worship at MCC. And we are in the third week of the season of Easter. Did you know that? Have you ever, have you ever heard of this, the season called Easter Tide? That's not really part of our church tradition here at Marine Covenant, but for Uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, the church at large has celebrated not just the day of Easter and not just Lent leading up to Easter, but they celebrate the Easter season, which is the 50-day period where we get to, um, the 50 days between Easter and then the day of Pentecost, which is where we recognize the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we get to lean into uh, the season of Easter because Jesus' resurrection, it affects every part of our lives, right? It, it, uh, it infiltrates, and as Pastor Jeff said last week, it permeates every part of our, our existence. It's our new identity, and it's how we live. And so as we, uh, like I said, we're in the third week of, of Eastertide, and um, we have this pithy phrase that I get, I'm, one of our pastors thought of it, and uh, we've been saying this together as a way of marking what this Easter season is all about for us and what we're going to lean into. So I'm going to invite you to say this out loud with me when we get it up there on the old screen. There we go. All right, let's say it up together. The resurrection of Jesus was the inauguration of God's bursting into our present with our future reality. Isn't that cool? So in other words, our eternal reality, when when Jesus' redemption plan was made complete by his rising from the dead, by his uh, his resurrection. And as we set up this Easter Plus series last week, Pastor Jeff asked two really important questions that I think if any disciple of Jesus, you know, is going to want to know the answers to these questions. And and the first one is a twofold question. It's, uh, uh, it was, um, what really happened as a result of the resurrection? How does that impact us? And the twofold answer is, well, he defeated sin and death and the power that it had over us and then the new creation has arrived, right? So he's defeated sin and death. Uh, Colossians 2.13 said that when we were were dead in our sins, God made us alive with Christ. And then the new creation has arrived. 2 Corinthians 5.17 said that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. Isn't that good news? Amen. Yeah, we got a couple of amen shout outs on that. So we talk about like, if you say, oh, what's the good news of Jesus? We tend to think of, well, the good news of Jesus is that my sin is forgiven. Amen. A hundred percent. But I think that the real good news for us in the new covenant of Jesus Christ and God's new promise that he made to us through the person of Jesus is that we too get to live a new life. That's the real good news. Romans 6, 4 said that we were buried with him through our baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too get to live a new life. There's our good news, right? And okay, so we had that that first twofold question. The second question was, all right, well, if we get to live a new life, how do we we live it? And the answer, it was a really no-brainer answer is, well, we live into God's promised future and we do that starting right now because why would we wait? And when Pastor Jeff said that, it reminded me of, remember at the end of When Harry Met Sally, when he's um, 
running across New York City, and he goes to the New Year's Eve party, and he's, he and Sally have been fighting, and Sally says, why are you even here? And he says, I came here tonight because when you realize that you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you want to, the rest of your life to start as soon as possible. That's why I'm here. And that's how we're to live into our true identities that we rediscover in Christ by putting off the old self and putting on the new self right now, starting now. Ephesians chapter 4 says that, um, says that we were taught with regard to our former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow, so that's our new identity then, to be created like God in righteousness, true righteousness, and true holiness. So we get to join with Jesus in this process of putting on the new self. Jesus doesn't just say, okay, boom, you're your you're, you're new self. No, he invites us into that process by saying, all right, what are you going to do to put on your new self? And so we get to have ownership of that. And man, when we really begin to double down in our, our new identities, right? And when we get to invest ourselves in, uh, in these new selves of putting on the new self, often there's some pretty big surprises in there. Wouldn't you agree? Maybe some of you, that's your story. Because when we, when we put on the new self that Jesus makes it possible for us in his resurrection power to do, there's no telling what kind of new identity that God is going to call us to. And that should be, should be exciting. I mean, we should get stoked about that, right? So here's what today's sermon is all about. The resurrection of Jesus calls us to bring life to our own souls by living into our new identities that Jesus gives us. And the truth is, I think that, you know, when we talk about our new identities, they really are just our true identities that God always intended for us in the first place, right? These new identities, they're, they're exciting. And so I think we, we love stories about people discovering what their new identity is and, and, and living into that. And there's usually an a, uh, a surprise part of that story where they're, su- they're surprised and taken by what it is that God has, uh, has made them into be. And it reminded me of, so I'm, obviously I, I watch movies a lot, and so <laughs> I don't read, but I watch movies. So uh, my daughter, I have two daughters, they're 10 years apart, and they both love this movie from the 90s called The Princess Diaries. Anybody ever heard of The Princess Diaries? Oh yeah. So, uh, so they were 10 years apart, so over the you know 15 years I got to see this movie hundreds of times, and um, it's a story about this girl named Mia Thermopolis, right? And she doesn't like her name, Mia Thermopolis, and she feels super average. Um, and she, but a, a, apart from feeling just average and, and, uh, and just kind of plain, she, she actually has some things of life that have stacked up against her. Like she didn't get to know her dad growing up, and she struggles with being really insecure, and she has this, she's petrified by Public speaking, there's a scene where she tries to get up in front of the class and is just frozen in fear with that. And so she grows up thinking that she's Mia Thermopolis, but she finds out that she is actually, she finds out she actually had a true identity that she didn't know about. She finds out that her true identity is that she has, is an heiress to a throne of a make believe nation called, does anybody know? Genovia. Man, you get bonus points if you know the Genovia theme song. I know it, or the national anthem, I should say. Um, uh, so she grew up thinking that she was Mia Thermopolis, just this boring girl from San Francisco, right? But then she finds out that when she's, when she's crowned as queen, she hears her true name. Her true name is Her Majesty Amelia Mignonette Thermopolis Rinaldi, Queen of Genovia. And that's the part where the moms are usually crying as they watch this story. Right? So she's called into this completely new identity where she's not only expected to learn about royal life, like learning how to wave at people like a queen. Julie Andrews teaches her how to do that. Um, but she recognizes that as she starts to lean into this new identity and this new calling of being a queen, she starts to realize, wow, I'm actually pretty, I'm actually good at this. And because she, she's not only called to be a queen uh, and do those royal things, but she 
Like she's got to sit in at parliament and she is affecting legislation. And when she meets the constituents, uh, she recognizes, oh my gosh, I actually care about these people that I lead. And so as she leans into her new calling, she recognizes that she is a called and gifted leader of people. Isn't that awesome? And uh, before, when she was just Mia Thermopolis, she was so afraid of standing up in front of people and leading them. But it turned out that that was actually her calling. It was what uh, she was made to be, who she was made to be. And so we love stories like this. And I think what makes them so enchanting for us is that we can empathize with someone like Mia Thermopolis because she had been led to believe that she was one person, that she was one thing, only to find out she was actually an heir to something that was so much bigger, so much bigger than herself even. And she overcomes those false narratives, you know, that her world around her had convinced her that she was only to go on to be, become, the, uh, you know, to do things that she would have never imagined were possible. And this taps into that excitement of discovering our true identities and our true noble callings and, and maybe even new names that represent who we have, who we have been called to be. So I want to go back to that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 passage that we looked at last week as Pastor Jeff kicked off this Easter Plus series. So if you have a Bible device or a pew Bible, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because we're going to look just a little bit deeper at how we're made to be a new creature, a new, excuse me, a new creation in Christ because our new identities begin with us being made new. In 2 Corinthians 5 15 and 17, it says that he, he just, Jesus died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And then if we skip down to verse 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Amen. Amen. And and here's the big thing. When we were made a new creation, we're no longer regarded by the ways that we were formerly n- known before we were changed by Christ. We should probably let that sink in a little bit because you know, yeah, you know, so many of us would be like, yeah, I met Jesus and, I, and the Lord gave me a, a new start in life. Amen, 100%. But I think that when we are in Christ, we are made into someone who's entirely different from who we used to be. And for some of us, uh, maybe even some of us in this room, that's a, that's a pretty big deal that we are made somebody different from who we used to be, right? So when we read this verse in, uh, in um, Paul's original language text, we can see how badly it was that he wanted us to hear this verse. Because it's easy to skip over it and be like, yeah, I'm made new, that's great. But no, Paul goes out of his way to make sure like, we really hear that. And he says, if someone is in Christ, they are a new creation. You're a new creation. Kine katesis, you're a new creation, which I think that would be a cool tattoo somewhere. Kine katesis. But then Paul really goes on to, uh, to explain what this means because there's this word that when we see it in scripture, edu, it's like if you look in your King James Bible, it would be like where they said, behold. It's like a, are you paying attention to this moment? Because he goes back and he actually repeats himself, doesn't it? He says, the old has passed away. And it's like he's saying, wait for it. Guess what? You are made new. It's a proclamation that we've been made new. And for, like I said, for many of us, the fact that we've been made a new creation is a big, big deal. Because for so many of us, our surroundings that we were raised in or where we came from or came out of had us convinced of an identity that just wasn't true, right? It just wasn't true. And it may have been that we weren't smart enough or good enough or talented enough or, you know, whatever. Or it may have even been something far worse than that that we were convinced of. But for, for some of us, man, the good news that because of the resurrection of Jesus and because we now get our new lives and because we now have new identities in Christ, for some of us, that's just such a big deal. And I just, I wanted to um, get up close and personal a little bit and share my own story and my story of my own false identity that I grew up, grew up with. And it's been a, a long road for me to unravel this. Uh, but when I grew up, I thought that I was invisible. I just thought I was invisible because I was the youngest of three 
and we grew up in rural Nevada County. This is the 1970s. I was, uh, my brother and I were latchkey kids. Um, we would get off the bus after school. We would walk the half mile home to our house and our, we were just there at home until our, our parents got home. And, um, and I, we had a sister, but she went to a different school. She, you know, she had different activities, but so every day after school, my brother and I, we were just there at home in our house. And unfortunately for me, my brother's, the way, well, the way he entertained himself was he just was a bully to me. He just browbeat me and, um, you know, became an expert at finding out how to make me feel really small. Yeah. And he had me convinced of a whole list of things that uh, years later I came to find out they weren't true at all. <laughs> Right? But in those formative years, man, he had me convinced. But the hardest part of all of this was when I would complain to my parents, and I'd be like, he's, you know, he's being mean to me. They never, really, they never really did anything about it. And so I just would fold inward and just relied on myself because as, you know, eight, nine, ten year old, I, I felt all alone. And I, if, man, if I had had a name tag, like a hello, my name is name tag, it would have said, hello, my name is invisible. Because I just felt like nobody saw me. And it wasn't until my, uh, my young adult years, you know, I grew up in a, a, a faith home, but I believed in, uh, I had been led to believe in this God that was so distant that I just was, I felt like, man, God doesn't, I'm invisible to the world. God doesn't see me either. But man, when I was a teenager, I was, in, I was introduced to the person of Jesus. And somebody sat me down and we read the Bible together. And I began to see that Jesus was, was a God who I wasn't invisible to him. And he saw me. He was able to empathize with me. He saw other people as well and invited me into that. And it was as though Jesus had said to me, guess what? You're your name is not, no longer invisible. You can take that name tag off. I have a new name for you, and your new name is going to be known and loved. That's who you are. That's your new identity. And I'm guessing uh, many of us have a very similar story um, of how we were introduced to our new selves when we met Jesus. So then, if we're a new creation, why? <laughs> For what purpose? Why are we made new? Why are we a new creation? Well, Ephesians 2.10 has one of our favorite verses about our new identi identity that we have in Jesus. And it says, for we are God's handiwork. We're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And we, we just, we love that word handiwork. It just is so inviting. And I imagine like, you know, the kind grandpa who is with their grandchildren, you know, it, um, is engaged with handiwork and, and some kind of crafty thing, or maybe does ho hobby trains and says, come and do this with me. There's, there's love in that phrase that we're created as God's handiwork. He created us because he loves us and he created us because he wants to have joy with us. But also, you know, we're God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus, and it says to do what? What are, we, what are we created to do? To do good works, which God prepared for us to do. And I see that word good works, and in a pejorative sense, I start to think of, like, doing good works. Like, hey, Mom, I did the dishes. I didn't scrub the pans, but I, you know, I did good things. But <laughs> I got to let them soak. Um, no, but... But what the Apostle Paul says when he's talking about these good works, it, it actually means way more than that. Uh, going back to this text, um, what Paul is saying for us here is, for we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance. And then he says, it literally says in Greek, so that we should live in them. We are created for good works so that vocationally, we live into those, and that becomes our life. That becomes what we do. That's why we see people in the Bible that get, their lives are dramatically changed by Jesus, and they, they live into that, and that becomes their new job. And this verb, peripateo, it, it speaks to us about continually leaving, uh, lead, leading your life that way. It's, uh, it's in the perfect tense. Like, it happens, and then we keep going in that way. And Paul says, that's how we live our lives. And then lastly, on this, uh, in this particular verse, when did God prepare our good works for us? When was it? 
in advance. Isn't that crazy to believe that God created us for us in advance our callings that we're going to have in God's kingdom? Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. Because if you're a person that knows your calling, then that's great. If you're someone who hasn't yet found your calling, guess what? God knows what your calling is. And that, that's a journey that, that we go on, and sometimes it takes a while to discern that. But God has already created for us a vocation that we get to live into, that, as Paul said, that we get to live into that. And, you know, it's just like Mia Thermopolis. She thought she was one thing, but her vocation that she had been called to was to be a leader of people. And so we get to live into our, our new callings and identities in Christ, and we get to live into these callings that Jesus had prepared for us all along. Whew, wow, that's a lot of good news for us. So question is, how do we live into this? What's the first step toward living into our new identity that we have in this resurrection power of Jesus? And I think the way we do that is we rehearse the truth of who Jesus is, and who Jesus has made us to be by daily living. And you're going to, please don't roll your eyes because you hear this from your pastoral team all the time. We live into our spiritual practices that we have so that we can stay in touch with the risen Jesus and, and the, not just staying in touch with who Jesus is, but staying in touch with the resurrection power that he has inaugurated in us. And, you know, we're talking about those kind of spiritual practices that remind us that Jesus is not dead. He is alive and that makes us alive in Christ. So it's rehearsing what's true about who we are and uh, how we think and how we live. Um, how, the things, it's rehearsing the things that we give our best resurrection energy to. That's kind of important because we don't want that siphoned off by meaningless tasks. And we make those things a regular part of our lives. And so I think there's a one-size-fits-all solution for how we can... Um, how we can step into uh, living into all of these things. And it's by choosing to be family of God people, right? So we've already done that today. You have chosen to be a family of God person by being here in worship. Um, and you might think, well, how's that gonna solve everything? But I think honestly, if we just say, okay, I'm in with being a person in God's family and God's kingdom, because we're gonna get all the things we need when we're here. Like we have, for example, we know that, if we're going to be connected to the vine, we got to be people of the word. We got to be able to be Bible and scripture readers and know, uh, hear who God has said that he is and who God says that, that we are. And if you're here, if you're part of God's kingdom family, there are so many opportunities for you to be able to learn scripture, learn the word, even globally. I mean, for crying out loud, you could just go on the internet and find some really amazing um, ways to stay connected to the vine through the word. And then, uh, you know, we rehearse the truth of our identities when we gather in worship, when we not just sing these songs about who God is and who we are, but when we gather uh, and choose to be here every week to hear the word being proclaimed over us and receiving that, that's a place that we can rehearse our true identity uh, is here in worship. And then, you know what? I think being part of God's family, this is where we're going to discern our new identities and the new callings that we have. It's going to happen in God's family. It probably won't happen, you know, in your fishing boat uh, as you, you know. Um, but it's going to be when we're gathered with God, as God's people because it's people that are here that are going to recognize in you your, the things that you're doing that are part of God's kingdom. And they're going to say, you're good at this. You've got, you've got special gifts and abilities for these things. This is where it's going to be. Uh, being in the presence of God's people is going to be the most likely way that we discover our special callings that God has prepared for us in advance. Uh, and we're going to live in, into those new callings and, and the church is going to affirm that in us. Speaking of affirming uh, in us and in in, in that identity piece, have you ever noticed in the Bible there are a number of different uh, places where we get to see that somebody in God's family, somebody in God's church was actually given a new name, not just a new identity, but a new name that spoke to their identity. Um, uh, and man, uh, man, I'm just going to give you some examples really quick. The, one of the most obvious ones was, remember Simon Peter, the apostle Simon Peter. He was a rough guy, right? When Jesus called to him and said, drop your fishing net and come follow me. And he said, okay, 
but he was, he was a rough, rough and tumble dude, and he struggled through a couple of years of, of his ministry with Jesus as he was learning and, and growing, but, and he was anything but stable, but at a really pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry, when things were about to just get, go to that next level of scariness, Jesus said to Simon, he said, Simon, who do you say that I am? And Simon said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In all of his brokenness, in that tiny little mustard seed of faith, he says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus looks at him and he said, what did he do? He gives him a new name. He says, because of your faith, Simon, I tell you that you are now called Peter. Your new name is Rock. And upon this rock, upon your faith, I will build my church and the gates, uh, the, the gates of Hades will will not overcome it. He gets a new name. This uh, rough and tumble guy who had been anything but stable, his new name in Christ is Rock. And then sometimes in the Bible, we don't even get to hear the whole story of how somebody received their new name. Like take, for example, the Apostle Paul. He had been Saul of Tarsus was his Jewish name, and he had been an enemy of the followers of Jesus, and he had even put some of them to death. He was notorious. Um, but when he encounters Jesus on the risen uh, on the road, uh, the risen Jesus on the road to Dis- Damascus, and God just turns his life completely upside down from where he was. And Jesus, or somebody, gives him a new name uh, that happened off the books. We don't find out uh, what, that, what that was, but later when, when he comes back around, he's not, no longer called Saul, his Jewish name, but now he's called Paul, which is a Roman name. Because somebody changed his name, or maybe it was him saying, I'm going, I've, I've been called to the, the Roman Empire to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, and you can call me Paul because I'm one of you. And guess what? Most of us in here are Gentiles, so we should be really thankful that, that Paul did that and changed his name, lived into his new identity that he had. Some people in the Bible, uh, um, we get to see a sense of humor in the new names. Like Eutychus, for example, in chapter 20 of Acts. Eutychus is a guy who, uh, he fell out of a window as he was listening to the Apostle Paul preach. He hits the ground, he dies. Paul comes and he prays over him. He's, he's brought back to life. And his name becomes known as Eutychus because what does Eutych- Eutychus mean? It means fortunate. He was fortunate as he was brought back to life. And what's really important about this is Eutychus was uh, the first person who was raised back to life way up in Turkey. That's way north of Israel. And the people of the, of the Roman Empire up there, they got to see the resurrection power that they had heard preached about in, G, uh, uh, in Jesus. They saw that worked out in the person of Eutychus. And he becomes known as Eutychus the Fortunate. But my favorite Bible name, uh, Bible um, name changing incident that really speaks to this new identity piece is from the book of Philemon. And here the Apostle Paul is, he's describing an enslaved man named Onesimus. And Onesimus had just found his new identity in Christ, and he had formerly been known as, so he was enslaved, right? You know what they called him? They called him useless. Can you imagine being an enslaved person and your name is useless and when they summon you, come here, useless. But the apostle Paul sends him back to the man he was indebted to, to Philemon. And he says, I'm sending him back, but he's no longer useless. Now his name is Onesimus. He is useful. This formerly enslaved man whose name had been useless goes on to become the the bishop of the church of Ephesus. He goes from enslaved to being a leader of the church. Isn't that awesome? How's that for putting on the new self? Well, I wanted to give us a chance to, um, to uh, reflect a little bit and think about this identity piece, this identity piece of being made a new creation in Christ. And uh, I don't want to assume that everyone here today uh, identifies with being a new creation. You might feel like, I don't know if I've ever done that. And so hear this invitation to just become a new creation in Christ by saying, okay, Jesus, I'm all in. And I will let you make me into a new creation. And as Pastor Jeff preached just a couple weeks ago, when we believe and when we say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do this, I'm going to take a step of faith, the Holy Spirit, which is every much every bit as much God as God the Father and Jesus the Son, 
the, the Holy Spirit comes to us and lives with us. And we begin that process of being transformed into a new creation. But how about you? Where are you in your identity in Christ today? So in this, uh, the, the seat rack in front of you, you'll see down low a small, smooth stone. And in the seat pocket, you'll find a Sharpie. We get to have new identities in Jesus. And uh, I want us to be able to create a token that we can take with us that will remind us not only who we used to be, possibly, but to remind us who we are now in Christ Jesus. And there's a couple different ways that this could go. Uh, you know, you might be like, man, I've already heard from the Lord and I know exactly, I know exactly who I've been made to be. I even know my new calling. And in that case, you can maybe on one side write your old name or your old identity and you can write your new one. So take me, for example, uh, as a latchkey kid who was bullied by my older brother, on the bottom of this stone, I'm deciding that this is the bottom. I'm going to write my old name. Invisible. Because it's important that we remember who we were because God uses those things in our story as he transforms us into new life. Then I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to write my new name so that wherever I leave this, whether it be in my car, at my desk, you know, maybe next to my toothbrush, I'm going to write known and loved so I can rehearse the truth of who I am. You might be in process with this already, and you might think, okay, I'm on the journey, but I, I don't know if I'm ready to write my, I don't know if I've heard from the Lord of what, it, what exactly my new name is. That's okay. You can leave this stone blank if you want. You can take it with you, and whenever God speaks to you, you can maybe write your new name. There's no wrong way to do this, but I wanted to give us a chance to lean into this and then have this token to take with us. Let's just take just a few quiet moments, and I'll just give you a couple minutes to, uh, to consider how the Lord is speaking to you, and then write your name on your stone. you, Jesus, that you invite us into this new life, being not just receiving a new identity, but being a whole new creation. That we get to not only just have a new start, but we get to live into who it is that you're calling us to be, who you're leading us to be. And for those of us who know exactly who you've redeemed us to be and have a name on this stone, Lord God, we say thank you. And for those whose stone has not yet been written upon, Lord God, we say once again, thank you that you'll be with them on this journey as they lean into being who you've called them to be. Lord God, thank you. We just can't, can't thank you enough. You've made us new. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, you stand and we'll continue to respond in worship. His careful 
sing that again. God who has been faithful to us, 
who by his resurrection makes us into a new creation and who prepared us in advance for the kingdom work that he created for us to do, our God is going to be faithful to see us through to the end of that journey. He's inviting us into our resurrection identities in Christ, remembering that the resurrection of Jesus was the inauguration of God's bursting into our present with our future reality. So let's put on our new selves together as God's church. Amen? You may be seated. If you are new or uh, newer with us, we'd love to have you stop by the Have We Met area that's out just outside this door, and I get to be the pastor that when you fill out that little digital form, I get to answer it. And so I would love to get a chance to meet you and welcome you to our church. And um, speaking of uh, new folks, uh, awesome, because I receive that email every week of all those new things that people say, when is the next class about what Marine Covenant Church is all about. And our next Explorers class is going to be on May 5th, Sunday, May 5th. So you can go on the events on the app and onto the events and register for that um, if you'd like to find out more about Marine Covenant Church and who we are. And uh, that's the best way to, to get to know us. Then we have some, you know, look all through the events tab for all those upcoming ministry events. There's so many things that our church always has going on, and that's the best way to find out what they are. And one of those things um, that's uh, coming up on April 27th at 11 o'clock, we're going to gather to remember Harry Jones, who was just a pillar of our church for decades here, who just passed this last month. And so we'll gather on April 27th for that at 11 o'clock. A lot of people have been asking, what time is that? Um, and so that's, that's coming up there. And then also you can get on there for the discipleship cohort that you've been hearing about. There are applications that you could fill out to be part of the discipleship cohort. That's on the events tab as well. So talk about that. Can we talk about that? We can talk about that. <laughs> wow, this is really spontaneous and uh, totally unplanned. <laughs> it's written right in Planning Center. I love it. <laughs> we, uh, we're going to tell you about the discipleship cohort again. Last week, we talked about it a little bit and uh, so that you were uh, becoming aware of it. But it's, a, it's something we're launching where if you are wanting to become further and deeper and hungry to know God and walk with God more closely, it's an intentional experience. Ben's going to tell us about it in a minute. But we gave away one of these books, which was sort of a picture of the discipleship cohort. We're actually using it as a prerequisite. It's part of the reading you have to do in the summer if you're going to join the discipleship cohort. It's called Practicing the Way. It's about be with with Jesus, become like him, and do what he did. This book is one of the best books on discipleship we've run across. And last week, we gave a bunch away. And we ran out. We ran out. So if well, well. only we had more books. Look, you have to say it. If only. Oh, we got a couple right we here. Couple In fact. Books. But this isn't quite enough for everybody. So maybe we should give one to everybody. What do you think about that? We bought enough books for we everybody. Books everybody for everybody. Everybody. everybody gets a book. Yeah. <laughs> you get Thanks, a book. Dude. And you get a book. We got one for every household. And so uh, we're going to bring them down. That's Come right, on, Benzie. Steve. We tried to give oh, away cars. We're going to uh, need a lot more. Our budget uh, left you. us with a book. Just take that That's right, book. Deanna. We, we, we'll get you. After. Everyone's getting a book. Hey, um, if we can do two things at once, um, I want to just tell you a little bit about our discipleship uh, cohort. Because what Michael preached is really the core of what we're trying. Look at all these people. Hey, every, we have plenty for everybody. Everyone's going to get one, I promise. <laughs> it's like we have free donuts. I love it. Okay, so what Michael is talking about in his sermon is really the Christian life, is that we went from having no name to a name, and Michael um, has done a ton of work. He didn't just prepare for a sermon and have this encounter with God in the way he went. He worked really hard to get there, and we want to create an environment for everybody to get there. Please, people, they love free stuff. Am I, am I right? Okay. All right, Does most everyone have their free stuff? Okay, so this is what we wanna do, is we wanna make sure that there's a space for you uh, for, to spend a year in a discipleship cohort where you get to learn your name, to have your identity fully shaped by who Jesus is and what Jesus has for you, for you to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, for you to discern your spiritual gifts and calling, and then to be putting your calling into practice. And really, that's a cycle that we do every year, every day of our entire Christian life. 
Um, and if you've been doing it forever and ever, thankfully so many people in our church have, that is great. But we're trying to help the next generation be people who can do that, who want to know who they are in Christ, how God's gifted them, and how they're activated for ministry. And so if that's something that you feel like God has put in your heart, it's a big commitment. It's a lot of homework. There's a lot of dates uh, of activities and things that are happening. If that's something that God has put in your heart, we would love for you to consider being a part of it. It is an incredible, incredible gift. And what is so fun, we get to do that and we get to experience this generosity. I hope you've experienced that the last few weeks, right? People have just been so generous um, towards us because we're trying to model what God has been generous towards us as well. But the reality is, is that all those books that we get to send out, we get to give that out because people are like, listen, We have resources, we have gifts, we want to give this to our church. And so people have helped fund to give that gift to you. So you're like, oh, I need free stuff. That's because people, right, gave money, gave resources to that to happen. In the same way, we need that to happen spiritually. We've all been given so much, we experience so much, and we want to be people who now are giving that to the next generation. So we really hope that you consider it. We hope that you apply to it. And uh, it is going to be a wild, wild time. So Spiro, I'm looking at you. Yeah, all right, great. Well, Ben... You want to tell them how to do it? We ran out of books. No. Well, I know. So how many of you did not get a book in the room that we, okay, the last couple rows over here. Oh, and then you guys. Okay. There. So listen, we got you. Next week, you got to come find me. I'm not going to take names. I'm not going to like get a card. I'm gonna, like, you just come find me. I'm going to have a stack of books, right? Easy. And we'll be ready to go. I can't believe we ran out. I mean, Bruce and Ruth took one, but that's okay. <laughs> So, but we'll get you, we'll get him there. <laughs> I get out my own personal copy too. Like it's got notes in it. Like, I know. I'm, I'm just giving you a hard time, Bruce. All right. All right. If you guys stand up, I'm going to invite Pastor Michael up. We're going to end our time with our benediction. God bless you guys. And what a gift it is to be together. I'll take the Kindle edition personally. That's just me. So, well, let's say together the Lord's prayer. This is a paraphrase of the Lord's prayer. Cause we don't want this to become something that we just say by rote. Right? So let's invest ourselves in saying the Lord's Prayer in a way that is new to us. We'll say this together. Our Father in heaven, may your name be respected and revered. Come and set up your kingdom, that what you want will be done here on earth, same as in heaven. Please give us today just what we need, no more, no less. Forgive our sins, just as we have forgiven those who did wrong to us. Keep us clear of temptation and save us from the evil one. For you are the king, you are all powerful, you are ablaze in beauty, and you will be forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, everyone.